Okay. Um, while we wait, I'll just give you a brief introduction of this webinar, which is brought to you by the EOSC Pillar Project, and this is going to be an overview of Germany and what the EOSC means for researchers. Um, this is a quick overview of the EOSC Pillar Project. It is one of the four regional projects that work on EOSC. In our case, we are specifically focusing on Austria, Belgium, France, Germany, and Italy. In our case, we're coordinating and harmonizing uh, national initiatives, infrastructures, and data services among these five countries. Um, these are some of the impacts of our project, and you will see more uh, in, this, in this webinar today. Especially, we will talk about uh, the USPR Ambassadors Program as well in session three of today's webinar. Um, these are just some housekeeping notes. Uh, welcome to the webinar. If you want to ask questions to our panelists, please, please use the Q&A function and they will be picked up when possible at the end of the sessions or in writing if we do not have enough time. The webinar is recorded and will be used uh, for your spiller activities. And of course, all the slides and the recording will be available on the website in the, on the event page after the event. Enjoy this webinar. Share your insights with us. You can find our contacts here and, and our social media for the Hospital project. And at this point, um, I will leave the floor to Sophie Kraft for the introduction of the webinar. Welcome, everyone. Hey, thank you. Um, I just set my screen sharing. So can you see my slides? Guess so. <laughs> so yeah, I just said thanks for uh, inviting me to chair this session. Um, yeah, my name is Sophie Kraft, and I'm a scientific officer at the NFGI Directorate. So I just want to give um, to start with the session some information on the um, connection between NFDI and EOSC from a um, association perspective. Um, Right. Um, NFDI is a member of the EOSC Association and is the um, mandated organization for Germany within the EOSC Association. And um, with this role as mandated organization, um, NFDI um, in the first step aims to coordinate the involved stakeholders in Germany, um, establish a forum for exchange and discussions between the German EOSC members and align the activities between NFDI and EOSC. Um, as we are still in the beginning as a mandated organization, this role might be specified uh, over time a bit more. So um yeah after this short overview um we can now start into the session um we have two panelists um and at the end of the session about uh, five minutes for a q and a um but before we start i'd like to introduce the panelists shortly um so the first panelist is um christoph Eber. in the nfdi context he's a spokesperson of the nfda matwerk uh, matwerk consortium and he's talking on NFDI and EOSC, um, the European data infrastructure. He is um, professor of micro and material mechanics at the Department of Microsystems Engineering at the Albert Ludwigs University of Freiburg and a de deputy head of institute at the Fraunhofer EVM in Freiburg. Um, he's also part of the steering committee of the platform Material Digital and um, scientific coordinator of the Fraunhofer Research Cluster of Excellence um, program Programmable Materials. Um, the second panelist is Kai Graf. In, in the NFDI context, he's involved in the Punch for NFDI consortium, and he's talking on supporting development of EOSC. He is a general manager at the Erlangen Center for Astroparticle Physics at Friedrich Alexander University in Erlangen, a member of the steering committee of the KM3Net collaboration, and um, he coordinates within the EOS cluster project ESCAPE, um, the work package of open science software repository. So yeah, thanks for being part of the session. And now I hand over to the first panelist, um, Christoph Ewald. Thank you, Sophie. Um, 
I cannot start the screen sharing yet. Uh, I think somebody has to try now. Ah, now. Now it works. Yeah, thank you. Okay, super. Great. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I think we have 10 minutes, so I will skim through it. I, I would like to motivate um, um, also from a domain perspective. Now, I will try to generalize that so that it's clear that it, I'm not only speaking for material science and engineering, but I think um, most of the questions we have for the infrastructure stems from specific scientific scenarios. And therefore, this is important to take into account for whom am I really doing uh, something and which parts, uh, let's say, are so general that everybody needs them. So for, in terms of community participation for us, uh, the NFDI has um, in the end roughly 30 consortia and this one consortia only concerns material science and engineering. And just to give you an idea of what we do, we have um, many consortia members all over Germany. And um, we not only have uh, people which are in the consortia where we have a contract and everything, but the second thing is our participants. And the participant projects are, for example, an excellence cluster uh, that can be 50 PhD students, several uh, groups involved, and then a lot of PIs, uh, up to 100 people directly involved in it. But it can be also, um, let's say, a smaller group which is trying to implement something like a lab uh, digital infrastructure and how to do that. So what do we want to digitize in the end? Um, reality is what we want to express somehow in not in tables, but really in an infrastructure which allows us to see the context. And what you can see here, this is a turbine blade. If we would have flown uh, to Brussels uh, or, or somewhere else, uh, we would have used this and in the inside it's very highly structured down to the electrons and we can simulate uh, and ex extract data with experiments on all different size scales. The second thing is all the properties this turbine blade has to have or a solar cell or anything like that is listed here. Depends again on different size scales and we are talking about going from, from sub nanometer to meters uh, where it matters. It, it's, it's a huge uh, stretch between them. And what makes it even more difficult, this information space, I would call it, is that these materials are not in a thermodynamic equilibrium. Yeah? So it depends on how you process them if you end up with the right structure as seen here. This makes it um, um, a tedious job uh, for material scientists, but if we look at ontologies or anything like that, semantic structuring of data and information, it starts becoming really difficult. Nevertheless, we believe this is the only way to really go from manufacturing processes for a sample, for example, to a tensile test and so on. This is not an ontology, but it helps describing how we can how we can get all these things together so that I know that the turning machine was involved, how long was the knife used and so on that influences my, my property in the end, which I want to report. So obviously we start often with raw data. We, we typically in a PhD thesis, uh, people put together then uh, this data, um, we get information like uh, you have the images here, you cut a material into small thin pieces and then you put it together again in a tomographic way. Then you use that as an input model for your simulation. What you add is knowledge. The materials models is a concept how I believe the material will behave and I can numerically, numerically solve now uh, if I press on something like this, how does it change? What we really are after and what our, uh, let's say, industrial partners, but also we as scientists are after is how can I become predictive? So if somebody delivers me parts of information here and the rest I, I acquire with knowledge, then I would like to go into this knowledge graph, find the right data, uh, and then enrich my data set and then make a prediction, how long will that thing probably last? Or uh, other th subjects like uh, we want to go to a hydrogen based uh, power uh, supply or anything like that. So we have to exchange a lot of materials. We want to go to a, a circular economy. So we have to exchange a lot of materials. It's, it's a huge job. 
Now, the current situation, as you know, is typically data is private good. That comes from the point that if I want to write a nature materials paper uh, or a nature uh, a communications paper, I have to get my data and not share it at all until I have put that out. And I have to fight for it to the last review to get that paper out. And then I get cited and then I get a new, new uh, more money. So when becomes this, let's say this data really public is one discussion we have to have. The second one is domain specific formats are there. We publish in papers. Papers are just knowledge, delta knowledge in the discussion in a text form. And then anything before that obviously is only uh, put into place so that I can explain how I argue in my discussion. So um, publishing papers is not the way to do anything uh, in terms of data, it's unfair. And then the infrastructure is typically local. So in our view, um, that making data fair can only be through standardization of the data on one hand side, but then also policies and we call it here business models, but the incentives for, for, for scientists needs to be there. If I don't get cited for data, then I will keep publishing my paper because then I get money from the European Union or from anybody else because I can show I get cited on my paper and not on my data. So there's a lot to do and it's not clear how to, how to um, uh, host that uh, completely. There are examples in biology and others where this is common uh, that we do that, but not in all of our subjects. Linked Data Infrastructure Federation and interoperability is clear. So in our mind, what, what really works is that the raw data will probably stay put uh, at the places where they are taken. Sometimes we can put it into one big cloud, especially if you want to do AI and learn from many different things. And um, what we try to do is, is as an example, we have workflows and software which connects all the machines locally uh, get all the data together, and then you can decide how you distribute it between the different um, institutions. Then uh, connect everything with a knowledge graph where we can try to reach out and find the data. Uh, we work together with the European Materials Modeling Council on the European Materials uh, uh, Ontology, the MO, for example, but also with others uh, on the engineering area and also natural science. The important thing for us is nevertheless to have a tight interaction with the community. This is why we thought having really um, uh, the scenarios for the infrastructure in terms of um, these projects and they bring in the requirements. You can see that here. And these requirements are really extracted from all these things. Then we derive the infrastructure use cases and we write them down and say uh, what kind of um, ways we have to validate what we implemented as an, as an infrastructure. Okay, and then we continue and uh, later on uh, when we have the implementation done, we do the rollout. And in that case, again, the infrastructure use cases, which we come from our participant project can test then as a better tester if it works for them and if it really is useful for them. And then we go and uh, roll it out to the, to the grander uh, community and go back to the next requirements. This is our vision and I would end here. So um, the idea is uh, with roughly 40 people for material science, for example, uh, we, we can implement a couple of things. We work together with a lot of different partners in the NFDI. We are involved in the EOSC uh, through different institutions, uh, but um, the, the, the grand scheme needs, for example, AAI, so authorization and authentication and other things which are distributed and uh, acknowledged from everybody. We need uh, standardized data. We need uh, tools to develop our ontologies, which are then uh, through different, uh, between different subjects uh, can interact. And we um, need to make an effort, also a cultural effort to really bring these things together. That would be my um, short uh, introduction uh, of one piece of the NFDI as exemplary and um, for, for many of our consortia. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I directly hand over to Kai Graf after this. <laughs> Yeah, thanks. Thanks a lot. Thanks for uh, the invitation and presenting uh, 
really a fair assessment as I was asked uh, of, of the uh, benefits of, of the EOSC and, and how we from the ESCAPE cluster are using the EOSC services and, and actually co-creating them. And what a scientific progress in uh, is the EOSC bringing to our scientific community. Of course, that's a large project that I'm talking about. So I can only give a few examples and I have to rush through, uh, uh, through it, but hopefully anyway, I will uh, convey my message. So just a few expectations. If, if I go somewhere in a webinar, it's always, what's the expectation for my EOSC? Okay, the expectations are bridging the fragmented solutions for, for those um, and having a federated data infrastructure across domains, across disciplines, across sciences to provide fair uh, open science product. So findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. And we heard from Christopher already about that, that this is a hard challenge. Uh, uh, we are going to manage it. And we want to uh, reuse analysis across borders and discipline. We want to add value to, to data-driven science. We want to make it reproducible. We want to make it interdisciplinary. We want to use digital in, uh, innovations across borders uh, everywhere. And sometimes uh, the user asks, oh, develop a full cloud solution with a dashboard integrating all the services that are necessary to do that research and please best from a click. We're definitely not there, but we're going, we're going there. So um, let me give you an overview of, of where we are there in the implementation phase. So the EOSC Future Project is currently implementing the EOSC as a system of system. And if I talk about escape and our co-creation, I, I just need to give you those few things that will be available for the EOSC uh, uh, in the near future. So the EOSC core services in, uh, in uh, the bottom here are the core base infrastructure and service components that are needed. Then we have the exchange layer, which is giving uh, generic and community specific services that add value to the core services. And one of the core services is AI, as we already heard. Um, then we have the interoperability framework on the side that makes this interactions possible, metadata, for example, definitions. Um, and of course, quite importantly, uh, uh, we know that all that doesn't work without a support activity for the users, for the researchers, but also for the uh, research environments uh, and infrastructure that are using it. So now shortly, what is ESCAPE? ESCAPE is a, an EOS thematic cell, a cluster of astronomy, astroparticle and particle physics research infrastructures. And you see those big research infrastructures. So most of them are ESFRI infrastructures on the European level with tens of thousands of users and, and scientists together. and and. We formed together uh, uh, to link to the EOS different kinds of services. I will not go into detail about that, but the idea is we have an analysis platform to do analysis. We have a, a, a software catalog where to publish our software and services so that they can pick up by different sciences also. Um, we have a data lake where uh, exabyte data scale uh, uh, data cloud is, uh, and uh, we are going also to citizens uh, science mass participation experiments, giving out our science already the step into the open there. Um, and we linked in the astronomy, um, which with, with their uh, virtual uh, observatory already have uh, years upon years of experience with fair data. Um, because they're using it. So just a, a few points where escape and EOSC are working together. So the central goal is, as we said, open science and fair research products. Um, of course, we want to do that by an economy of scale with co-development, deployment, and cross-fertilization on all the different levels, and to establish and implement best and common practices within and across our eyes. And we already know that even within a community, the standards are so different that it takes time uh, to, uh, to really level those out. Um, 
Then we are linking to the EOS curve services where they are, or we are co-developing where it's necessary, for example, for the AI and monitoring, but on the other hand, also to the interoperability framework for metadata, for example, metadata for software, how to describe your software. Um, we are providing those services or will provide in the future our services at those exchange, EOS exchange level that I have already told you. Um, but we will do so by the um, uh, service levels as they are actually employed and developed by the research infrastructure themselves. So this is this semantic answer so that the EOSC is really just a federation of different services, uh, also driven by the needs of the, uh, of the individual community. Also very important, the training of, of data and software custodians in the EOS regime, that's visibility. We already heard from that from Christoph already, but also we want to generate new users for the open science products that are there, that are probably linked because they're not findable uh, or hidden in, in a layer. Publish our scientific workflow so they can be picked up also outside our community um, and establish community solutions. And uh, clustering together, of course, we're gaining visibility and also influence on the strategic alignment. So uh, we have the leverage of the experience in the feed. So high energy uh, physics data volumes are the biggest data volumes in science that we have. We have the fair data in astronomy for years and those we can leverage and bring into EOSC. Um, but all our uh, developments are really based on the user and, and research infrastructure needs. We're use, taking the use cases and implement the use cases. It's nothing for just to develop something, but really driven by use case, by the sustainability and long-term life cycle. Um, as I already said, we have this them a thematic cell ansatz, and that is now really in the in the EOSC established. Uh, over the years that I'm in there, at the beginning it was uh, thought EOSC is, is really one cluster, but now the th thematic answer. So the communities and the federation is uh, is implemented here. We already heard that from Christoph that it's necessary because all communities have different needs there. Um, and also a, a second point, uh, and Raphael is here, he will probably chime into that as well. Um, uh, we have established now that that not only data is, is important, it's also software that it's important. Uh, we cannot uh, really analyze or understand our data without the software um, and uh, actually make visible the, the work that scientists or technicians are actually doing also on, on that part uh, of our uh, science is a necessary part and is now visible uh, uh, really in EOS. So that's, that's already a big step ahead. So how do we already today use Kiosk and, and you can do that uh, as well. You probably uh, all know Zenodo where you can uh, publish your, um, your uh, software, your data, your publication and anything. And you directly end up um, in, in uh, um, EOSC with that uh, here in the open uh, air. And, and you see, I just searched a few days about, uh, ago on, on EOSC. So we have something like 65 publication there and that's growing now, now of course, uh, because uh, escape is ending by the end of next, uh, by the beginning of next year. Um, but there it, it's easy. So there you already have the visibility. We You talked about uh, having a, a, a new, um, um, and you, uh, you need to, to get new money. So here, EOS is immediately, uh, you is immediately seeing what you're doing, where you're doing it. And all that, as I said, is driven by, uh, by use cases. And we are uh, together with EOS Future driving those test science projects further. So we really want to demonstrate multi-domain science across our escape community. So uh, we chose uh, two projects, so the dark matter, so 25% of the universe is dark matter. So let's find that. Um, and the extreme universe and gravitational wave science project. And those we are, we are now pushing forward and trying to, to enable really cutting edge open science with those making use of the EOS services um, and uh, implement those in EOS future. And that will immediately give us really the feedback on the capabilities delivered by ESCAPE and EOSC. Um, and it really benefits science 
science goals in our domain that you uh, that I have already mentioned, and that's also uh, as we are talking about multi-layer that's also uh, supported by the GINA so that's a, a joint ECFA, NUPEC, APEC activities in that field um, and quite a lot of the EOS related project have similar user and project engagements and, and I can only ask you if you're thinking about going to EOS try try out those different uh, EOS projects there they use, usually have a call for for user engagement there as well. Talking about the user ben, uh, benefits, and I uh, simply stole that from Ari Asmi uh, from the EOS science cluster perspective. So what does that EOS bring to res uh, research infrastructure users? I'm now talking about those. So really the relevant interdisciplinary, how to understand metadata, the more efficient and, and interoperable services, less disruption because you're using existing service, reduced costs, of course, is also an issue. Then the documentation and the examples, how should I do my science? Uh, then virtual data platforms and the potential to create own data services and uh, also the potential for true interdisciplinarity, uh, which we are all aiming for. So in summary, EOSC is more than can be easily found on the EOSC portal. The next session will be on, uh, on that, but it's not yet or might never be what one might want to expect from a science cloud when talk, uh, thinking about an Amazon cloud. But we are reaching farther than that because we want to break uh, through the silos and really make interdisciplinary uh, research possible. The efforts continue on, on many different stakeholders and then uh, many levels. So there are really now the possibilities to shape and co-create the EOSC. And, uh, um, you can follow all that on, on the EOSC Association uh, newsletter, for example, but there are different newsletters around. With that, thanks. And if you're interested, follow that link. Thank you. Um, yeah, thank you both for these interesting insights. Um, yeah, you can now type some questions. We have uh, some minutes left until the next session type your questions into the Q&A field. I have one question. Um, how can our research data become interoperable with EOSC? Um, yeah, who wants to answer this question? I guess it's I, for both speakers or for I you can, especially. <laughs> I can kind of try to pick that up. Of course, uh, you know that, that EOSC has diff uh, many different uh, service providers already. Um, so that uh, the um, that you can go there, for example, by B two Find is is a service that is already available if you have a uh, 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 smaller data samples. For us, the problem is the the petabyte data samples that you probably will not find in uh, in the EOS. Now that's what what we are focusing on, on providing. But there are quite uh, uh, many different uh, data providers that will and force you to uh, add metadata as a description to your data so that they are really interoperable in, in the ESC. Maybe I can add to it, uh, but the, the domains need to sit down and find the right metadata, not uh, in astronomy and also in, in particle physics, for example, they have large equipment. Yeah, if I look at chemical labs or material science labs or, or also applied physics labs, we typically have a lot of different machines, yeah, which are small and, and self-built and so on. And, and often metadata is not standardizable so easy. So it's a, a long process we have to go into, but it's totally worth it. So I, I think there is wherever the metadata standards are there already, it, it already helps. Yeah. And I'm fully with Kai. So so the metadata is, is something like a fail kind of thing, yeah? And, but I also would like to say the incentive to, to, to put the metadata structure it and put the data there, that's an effort. Not all the projects are covering it, yeah? They, they start covering it, but, but they haven't done that before. So there's a lot of treasure lying around. And, and the question is, if I can make it useful for the, for the scientists to really upload their data also after the project by being citable and everything and, and showing impact, then, then the world is changing, I think. Fully agree. Yeah. <laughs> 
Um, perfect. Um, we now <laughs> are already at the end of our session. So I hand over to Rebecca. Um, but yeah, the I guess the Q&A tool still is open. And I've seen a, uh, some questions in the chat. Please uh, type it directly into the Q&A. And yeah, thanks for um, your presentations. <laughs> yeah, thanks a lot. Thank you, Sophie, for the transfer. <laughs> Hello, my name is Rebecca. I am part of the EOS project as well. And I'm chair of this second chair session in which we want to present you the EOS portal already mentioned by Kai, as well as we related services. And as this event is called workshop, I am now sending you the link to the EOS portal and I want to invite you to visit it with me. I will now share my screen, but you can do it for yourself as well. Boom, boom, boom. Yes, give it free. This is the EOSC portal. It's so to say your entry to the EOSC ecosystem. And it's, we have to admit it's not the portal. Kai already said it, it's, it's there's an increasing number of portals developing. Nevertheless, it's one big portal in growing portal. It's not finished yet. It's work in process, as is EOSC, the EOSC project. And this portal provides a catalog of services related to educational topics and information material for different scientific domains. And to get into this catalog, you may just scroll down and see here the different categories or domains and click on them. Or if you want a general access, you can click on service and resources. And thereafter, browse now. Oh, my, my computer is so fast. And here you can see the catalog, the different categories again, with the number of services provided in it, as well as filter functions to find your specific um, scientific domain you're interested in. And well, we can now select one service if you want to. We can click on processing and analysis, for example, as it has most services provided. Then you see here a big number of services. Oh, it's still loading, I'm sorry. Big number of services which you can select, which are open access to you, for example, Mm. Uh, I select just the access to open data platforms. And as we open it, we get more information about this service here generally written, as well as here on the right sidebar, we see words available, who's the target user of this service, and further details are provided as well. And additionally, you can also find access to the resource right here. So if you are interested, please feel free to use this portal to get to know it. As I already mentioned, it's working process. So there's an increasing number of services coming to this portal. So it might be interesting for you to visit it from time to time. And in the next, well, well, 15, 20 minutes, we want to present you three very interesting services related to this portal. One service that is not yet in the portal, one service for a specific scientific domain and a European wide service. And let's start with the service not yet in the portal. I am happy to introduce Marco Kulücke from the German Climate Computing Center, who presents us his service on agile fair data for environment and earth systems communities. Marco, the stage is yours. Great, thanks for the introduction. I'm going to share my screen. And now you should see the presentation. Can you see it, Rebecca? Yes, thanks. 
Great. Yeah. Thanks for the introduction. I'm going to present you the use case Agile Fair Data for Earth Environment and Earth System Communities, which is use case 6.2 in the ESC Pillar project. Um, I'm briefly going to give you some context about the use case, then I'm going to show you the problems which we addressed and show our potential solutions. Uh, during the talk, um, and also due to the limited time, I will focus on the work which has been done on our side from the German Climate Computing Center. In general, we are targeting um, data scientists and data analysts with our use case. Um, our use case spans across various domains. It handles different data sources and also large volumes of data, which are stored in multiple and distributed data repositories. Uh, more specific, our use case deals with earth environment and geoscience domains, which include ocean, atmosphere, solid earth, and climate science. And my background is in climate science, so I'm going to focus on this part. Um, the data sources in these fields are in situ observations, satellite observations, and our field climate models. And the goal of our use case is to provide an analysis workflow where data, products, code, and provenance information can be produced in a fair way. So how does the data access and processing look today? Well, today it can be quite tedious because you need to register for multiple discovery portals and catalogs. You have to use multiple services and you have to download. Yeah, maybe sometimes you have to even download locally data sets which you want to add, analyze. This can make it very time consuming because the data formats are slightly different and it can, can take time to compile them. And often you have limited resources available for your analysis. So I think not everybody has access to a high performance computing system. So often scientists also are reliant on their personal computer for data analysis. So how will the data access and progress look tomorrow? In the future, the data discovery and processing will be closer together, and it also includes various scientific domains, which makes it easier for cr cross-discipline um, data analysis. Um, it's going to be something like an European alternative to your Amazon Web Service, but as already mentioned, it's not going to be the same, but it's going in this direction. And this platform also contains use cases, which reflect the FAIR data, which reflect the FAIR data guidelines. So how does it look in practice? Um, we at the German Climate Computing Center um, converted 20 terabyte out of our five petabyte climate model data pool into the cloud optimized ZAR format. And in this format and in the cloud, the data can be accessed from everywhere via HTTP without any login. Um, how does the data processing look like? Um, the data can be processed at the ESP Pillar of Science virtual runtime environment which provides a web processing environment. Um, it features a Jupyter Hub, which many scientists might be familiar with using Jupyter Notebooks. And it also features, um, features multiple Conda Python environments. So you can pick the environment which suits your analysis best. Um, you can already find some use cases in this portal. I will briefly mention those use cases. So for example, here you can see one use case where you just open the data catalog via the first code cell, and then you can have a look at it. You can select the data set you want to use. You can immediately open it within the program, and then you can, in this case, do a simple analysis, just print the annual, uh, the daily maximum temperature for Hamburg. You can also do more complex analysis like multi-model comparison because there are different, um, many different climate models within this uh, data cloud, which makes it easy to compare models with each other. Yeah, but this is just an example of what's possible. And at this stage, I recommend to have a look at the video where we um, show the use cases in more detail. And this link is also available on the uh, website of this event. So you don't have to write anything down here. Um, our use cases make, make use of the Pangeo infrastructure. So Pangeo is a community which promotes open, reproducible, and scalable science, which makes it easier um, to set up scientific infrastructure and also conduct scientific research. Um, to summarize my talk, I'm 
yeah, this technical implementation plan summarizes my talk. So um, here we can see the user accesses the uh, VRE, which I already showed to you. And then this VRE uh, directly accesses the data via the data lake, which is stored in distributed data repositories. Um, currently, the data discovery happens directly over the catalog, but in the future, the data discovery will happen via the F2DS, which means Fair Federated Data Space, which provides cross domain catalogs of different data, so satellite data, in situ data, and climate model data. Um, yeah, you see, this is still work in progress, but we already have some promising first showcases. Yeah, this brings me to the end of my talk. and. I'm happy to answer your questions in the chat later. Thank you, Marco. Due to the time, I would say we just continue with the second presentation. A uh, service for a specific scientific domain, a really advanced scientific domain. Anton Günsch from the Free University of Berlin will present us the Global Genome Biodiversity Network. Anton? Yeah, thank you. I'm here. Can... Hi, hi. Um... And we see your screen. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for the invitation to present uh, the global genome uh, biodiversity uh, um, in this conference. Um, um, actually, I'm, I think there's no direct connection from GDBN to ERC yet, but I, I'm taking this as an opportunity to learn more about the, about the EOSC services and, and possibilities for, uh, for collaboration. I would like to start with a little bit of uh, history. At GGBN, uh, the name suggests actually that it's a worldwide organization, which it is. But uh, actually, it started uh, as a German uh, initiative called DNR, Bank Netzwer Net Netzwerk, uh, which was funded by the German Science Foundation uh, some 15 years ago. And, and it was a, um, a cooperation of uh, four major scientific uh, biological collections in Germany uh, who aimed to de develop standards and technologies for uh, pro providing open ac access to their DNA and, and tissue samples they were collecting and holding. And uh, the idea was to provide a link between uh, well-documented voucher specimens and uh, sequences in the international sequence databases. And this project was actually very successful and received a lot of international attention and it turned out that there's a great demand from uh, global research collections for exchange and publication of DNA data. And consequently, the GGBN, the Global Genome Biodiversity Network, was founded uh, in 2011 uh, with the mission to make high quality, well-documented and vouchered collections that store DNA or tissue samples of biodiversity discoverable for research through a network community of biodiversity repositories. And basically the two major areas of activities of GTBN are first around building a community, uh, which provides a platform for communication of the partner organizations, which is a platform for developing and agreeing on standards for data exchange, as well as curation standards, for example, and also to develop documentations around DNA collections. So that was more the community part or is more the community part. And there's also a technical part around the GGBN portal, uh, which allows instance access to the DNA catalogs of the partner institutions which uh, has mechanisms for linking voucher specimens and sequences, which has an order system for physical material. So if you need for your personal research DNA material, for example, you can use GGBN to, to order these materials. It has a document library and extensive, and it integrates very well with major biodiversity informatics networks 
with uh, GBIF, the Global Biodiversity Information Facility, being the most prominent one. So that's an overview of GGBN uh, members. Uh, there's a worldwide distribution, as you see, with a certain uh, bias on Europe and uh, North America, but still it's, it's, it has a good worldwide distribution. And presently, uh, via this network, uh, uh, there are 1 point, around 1.7 million DNA samples accessible and available, as well as 1.6 million tissue samples. The portal technology, I will not, I will not go into detail, but uh, it's important to know that everything is built heavily built on top of standards. Um, at two levels, the first level being content standards, uh, such as ABCD and Darwin Core, and uh, the second level being standard protocols, such as BioCase and so-called IPT, which allow us to, uh, to exchange data really seamlessly. And uh, the portal technology is entirely based on open source software. There's a, a range of components involved there, harvesting component, auto correction of data of the members, uh, semantic enrichment. There's an index database for fast searching and so forth. And uh, an important principle is that all data providers have full control over their data. So they are not giving their data away. It, it stays with, in, with the institutions. A few words on fairness, um, findability and interoperability um, as part of the global infrastructures is, I have to say, really part of the core mission. So that's all about fairness here. And uh, the services are open to all and based on established data standards and protocols. Uh, sustainability, GDBN is funded by its member organization. You can uh, pay in cash or in kind, in kind, for example, by contributing to the uh, technical development. And there's a permanent coordination structure, um, which is held by the GGBN Secretariat uh, in Washington, by the Smithsonian Institution, as well as the Technical Management Office, which is hosted by the Botanic Garden Berlin at the Freie Universität Berlin. But uh, we have to be honest, we still need additional project funding, uh, for example, to keep up with, with the increasing, rapidly increasing data volumes and additional uh, technical requirements. And that's all I have for today. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anton. And I would say we switch to the third presentation, to the third service, the European wide service will be, will be will be presented by Jerome Pansonel. I hope my pronunciation is right from the Hyper Korea Multidisciplinary Institute who presents us containers and general processing units as a service. Jerome, did I pronounce you that bad? Okay, can you hear me? Yes, thanks. Hi, hi. Hi, yes, it's all very well pronounced. Uh, I thank you. Um, so let's first uh, share my screen. Um, can you see my screen? Yes, thanks. Right. Okay. Um, so uh, I thank you for uh, inviting me uh, to present um, this uh, service, this service, uh, the container and GPU as a service use case um, that is now uh, fully available uh, all across uh, Europe. Um, uh, so I present shortly myself. So I am Jean-Paul Sanel. Uh, I'm working as a research engineer uh, at the uh, IPHC, uh, Uber Curian Institute in Strasbourg. 
And I am involved in uh, developing uh, and maintaining um, IT services for uh, European uh, wide scale uh, uh, research communities uh, since uh, more than uh, 10 years now. Um, um, so, uh, let's a few words about the container and GPU as a service um, uh, uh, facility. Uh, this service is hosted uh, by the SIGN platform. Uh, the SIGN platform is a, a, a facility that is hosted at IPSC, as I before mentioned, uh, a research institute based in Strasbourg. And this platform is dedicated to the processing and the management of massive scientific data. Uh, we started uh, now uh, 15 years ago uh, by, provi by providing uh, resources to the um, uh, worldwide grid uh, computing facility, uh, mainly for the WLCG uh, uh, on the LCG experiments. And now, uh, since now uh, 10 years ago, um, we are also providing a cloud computing uh, service uh, for uh, many other uh, scientific domains. Uh, like bioinformatics, cheminformatics, uh, and so on. Uh, we are also providing uh, a data management facility based on the IROTS software. Um, we are open to regional, national, and international scientific actors uh, uh, since the beginning because uh, we were providing a free computing facility, and this facility are open to worldwide access. Uh, concerning the cloud uh, facility, it's already used by several partners, uh, mainly uh, Bell2 for the on CMS for the HP uh, Eigenavi physics uh, community, uh, for more uh, transdisciplinary uh, and for the long time science, uh, we are more using uh, uh, providing resources to France Re with our research infrastructure in France, and the. Uh, uh, NGI for uh, the French NGI for uh, the uh, EGI uh, Foundation. Fine as well. Okay. Okay, so I go back to this. So I am still on page two. Um, uh, okay, so I was speaking about the partners. Um, yeah. Um, and we are also providing resources to the uh, French uh, Bioinformatic Institute. Uh, on, on a larger scale to uh, Elixir uh, uh, when needed, um, for example, uh, with uh, uh, interaction uh, either through EGI or uh, by uh, the EOSP lab project. Uh, and uh, since now, uh, three years, uh, uh, we are providing uh, GPU uh, from the cloud, uh, inside the cloud. The GPU, um, there are several types of GPUs that are now available. Uh, so all of them are from the uh, uh, NVIDIA uh, provider. Uh, we have uh, the V100 uh, RTX 2080 Ti, who is uh, uh, for uh, more, uh, it's not from the uh, CUDA uh, series, but more for the, the large public uh, on the TFR uh, more recently. Um, and uh, as the cloud is based on OpenStack, we are providing two types of services uh, that are based on the modules of OpenStack called HIT and Magnum uh, that permits to deploy easily um, uh, Kubernetes clusters uh, and as a uh, large uh, IT system that can include uh, GPU, uh, other kinds of uh, um, uh, accelerators who are now uh, integrating uh, FPGA, for example, uh, to uh, offer the, a large uh, panel of um, hardware uh, to the users. So, um, uh, as I told you, uh, so we are already uh, involved uh, in the uh, European, uh, at the European scales. Um, and it was already true at the beginning of the US Pillar project because we were, uh, we were integrated in the EGI federated cloud since uh, 2015. Uh, and EGI is the first class actor in EOSC on providing a lot of support for joining um, all the EOSC uh, part. Uh, uh, maybe, for example, so, uh, we, I, 
we have uh, mentioned before, the so ask uh, portal. Uh, they are uh, providing support to join uh, and describe all our services inside this uh, portal. Uh, we were uh, already connected to a centralized uh, accounting uh, on more uh, important uh, the uh, centralized AI based uh, on the um, uh, uh, Edugain uh, uh, Federation. Uh, on the AI is based on a well-known uh, protocol who is OpenID Connect and can be used uh, by lots of software. That's very important. Um, the services uh, is uh, uh, has been uh, clearly uh, is clearly needed by by several uh, ESPLR use cases. Uh, uh, that's uh, the WP 6.2, 6.3, and 6.5. So we, uh, we cover a lot of uh, kind of uh, science. Uh, 6.2 uh, is for uh, health science. 6.3 is for uh, ecology and environmental science. And 6.5 is for uh, humanities. And there are also some services that are requesting uh, our resources. Uh, but uh, of course, uh, all was not done as so there was some uh, work to, to do before to be uh, uh, fully uh, included inside the uh, uh, to be uh, and to be fully usable by all our partners uh, more easily than to, uh, was, was uh, provided before. So uh, first of all, uh, in 2019, when the EOSP uh, pillar project started, uh, we were not visible inside this portal. Uh, policy documents uh, were missing. Uh, website and documentation uh, was only in French. Uh, the sustainability and business model uh, was not addressed, and it uh, lots of work has to be done on these points. Uh, and it was also not clear how we could manage the support activity uh, with larger communities. Uh, the sign platform uh, is managed by a team uh, of uh, around uh, uh, three uh, ETPs, uh, so FTE in, in, in English. Sorry. Uh, and a, we have to, to, to manage uh, uh, the correct user support uh, by a limited uh, number of human resources. So this, uh, this has to be addressed. So uh, shortly to finish uh, the presentation, what has been done so far? Uh, first, uh, the policies. We have written uh, several documentations and policies uh, for the users and uh, scientific communities uh, to know uh, uh, what are the uh, condition of use of the service, uh, how they can uh, join, uh, how with the access policies, how we can accept them, uh, how we take the decision to uh, offer them the support and with which terms. Uh, what was really important uh, and to be, in, uh, uh, um, to, to be uh, in adequation uh, with uh, uh, the GDPR uh, law uh, was to have a cloud data privacy uh, a policy and also a technical and organization measure documents who describe what we are doing uh, on the security uh, level. Uh, for some of these policies, um, we were uh, we have we got the support from EJS project, uh, who is another EOSC project related project. And what is uh, very important is uh, uh, for people who are uh, providing IT uh, services is to look at the FITSM uh, uh, tra uh, training on standards. Uh, who aims at uh, improving the quality of the services. And they are providing uh, several document documents uh, on templates uh, for helping you to uh, get uh, further in your quality. So that's very, was very important for us. So, so all these documents are now available on online. Uh, concerning the user support, uh, web and documentation uh, has been translated. Uh, we have also uh, prepared training concerning the cloud, concerning other uh, in-kind services like iRoads. Uh, and now the last part where we are uh, still working on is uh, concerning the sustainability. Uh, <clears throat> also, uh, for uh, the services, uh, we, uh, we have implemented lots of good practices so that's on this site is very uh, good for us. What is more... Uh, uh, non-ongoing work is uh, concerning the business model. So how can we uh, 
provide more resources uh, for all the European users who will who wants to have access to resources like GPU uh, or FPGA. That's uh, seen an open question. With EJS, with the support of uh, um, the projects from the European Commission, but uh, for uh, uh, oncoming project, I don't know uh, if it will stay this case or not. So. That was my last slide, and thank you all for your attention. And uh, do not hesitate if we have any question. Thanks. Thank you, Jerome. Considering the time, I'm I'm sorry. These three presentations have been pretty interesting. Thank you, guys. And if someone of you has got some questions, please feel free to use the Q and A button, and we will answer this your questions in there. And I would say we just start with the third section now, and I hand over to yours. Thank you. Thank you, Rebecca. Um, first of all, I'd like to invite everybody in the panel to switch on their cameras so that we're all visible. And, um, and then we'll go to a short, short round of introduction. My name is uh, Jos van Weijer. I'll be sharing this um, this session, sharing and chairing the session. Um, as I said, um, we'll do one round of introduction and there will be a short presentation, a pitch talk uh, by uh, Marie Suret, uh, where I'd like to start with her so she can deliver immediately her message uh, because the, the panel is supposed to reflect on everything that we have that have has been presented the last and the last in the in the in the in the webinar so far. So Marie, for us first of all, you are the floor. Introduce yourself and tell us what you want to tell us. Thank you. Well, I will also share my screen. So sorry. There I am. So thank you very much for this warm introduction. My name is Marie Turay and I joined the University of Vienna and EOS Pillar a year ago. I'm responsible for a task about community building and stakeholder engagement. Therefore, this task supports the promotion of EOS in the academic environment. My talk will be just uh, three minutes long, but uh, yeah, uh, I give you a short overview of the so-called EOS Pillar Ambassadors Program. I will report briefly on what has been done so far and on our plans for a podcast series. Then I will present how you all can get easily involved in promoting EOS. And yeah, I'm happy to answer your questions via the Q&A. First, what is the EOS Pillar Ambassadors Program? We want to support everyone interested in open science to get a deeper insight into EOS. Our focus is on explanations and illustrations of EOSC, making its concepts tangible and practical, especially for researchers. Therefore, the long-term goal is to ensure knowledge transfer and awareness raising. Now to the so-called communication kit of the EOSC Pillar Ambassadors Program, we offer an information package to support everyone who wants to get involved in raising awareness for EOSC. On our webpage, you can find more information and download promotional material such as flyers, presentations, and posters in English, German, French, Italian, and Dutch. We are currently working on two videos and a podcast series, and all these materials should introduce EOSC and explain how researchers can benefit from it. So please have a look at our website. Yes, you will be so nice and post the link. Um, yeah, um, and I also want to add, we invite to adapt the EOSC information package to your needs and share it with your network. So moreover, what's next? Our next big step is the production of a podcast. In Stories of Data, the open science talk, we aim to provide more specific infos about EOSC and EOSC pillar services. Our goals are first, introducing EOSC, what is EOSC? Second, more practical for researchers, using and accessing EOS. So we are also introducing tools and services of the EOSC community. And mentioning the EOS community, I come to the most important slide of this PowerPoint presentation, get involved. We invite you to share the communication kit with your network, 
We invite you to use the communication kit yourself and become an ambassador for EOSC and Open Science. We invite you to support us with concrete ideas and contributions to the materials of the EOSC Pillar Ambassadors Program. With this, I want to close my presentation. Um, I'm happy to, uh, to answer related questions after the session or well, in the Q&A or anytime via email. Um, yeah, thank you very much for your interest and attention. Thank you. Thank you very much, Marie. And we'll go immediately to um, the other panelists of this session. I would like to give um, in this sequence Birgit Gemeinholzer, Rafael Ritz, and then Achim Streit the possibility to introduce themselves and maybe to give a short vision or um, on the benefits of direct or directions of, of EOSC. Please, Birgit, go ahead. Thank you. My name is Birgit Gemeinholzer. I'm a botanist working at the University of Kassel and a member of NFDI for Biodiversity. I'm also in the committee for GBIF for the German Science Foundation, so I'm linked to EOSC as well. And my statement is that we need data exchange. As a biologist, we depend on uh, global data or especially European data, and we need fair and open data standards. And I'm very much uh, supporting the idea of linking a smaller network into a bigger one, but this is a big achievement. Hello, good afternoon. My name is Raphael Ritz. Um, I'm a physicist working at the Max Planck Computing and Data Facility in Germany, where I'm responsible for the uh, uh, data services. But in that capacity, I'm also engaged in uh, various other activities as national, at national, European and international levels, such as the NFDI endeavors and a, a couple of consortia, uh, the uh, several EOSC activities and projects, but also the Research Data Alliance, where I'm, for instance, the chairman of the board of the German chapter, uh, uh, Research Data Alliance Germany or Deutschland, as we say. I have a couple of ideas and take home messages to provide as feedback, but I think that's for the second round to come. Okay, so uh, last but not least, my name is Achim Streit, uh, director of the Steinbuch Center for Computing at uh, KIT. And I'm also a professor for computer science. Um, I do have close to 20 years of experience uh, in large national and European infrastructure projects. And of course, today, this includes also uh, a few NFDI projects and uh, a few USC projects where uh, KIT is involved. Thank you. Now, I'm not sure if the audience is sitting on any burning questions already. But in that case, I'd like to ask them to keep them for them or post them in the chat so we can pick them up later. Um, sorry, in the Q&A session. And I would like to start with a question uh, on this that, um, that is linking everything that we have heard, uh, I think, to your experience, and we really like to hear your experience in this field and your reaction to that. Um, and we have seen that uh, the current uh, state of the implementation is already very attractive for various services and various researchers. Um, at the same time, we as a project had um, two surveys done. And it turned out that in these surveys, EOSC was not at the moment seen as something important, something that was known for part, yes, but they, that there, there was some hesitance of, of participating in this. Um, now, I'm asking you, let's say in the same sequence as that you have um, introduced yourself, um, what would you recommend towards the short-term implementation of, of, of EOSC and, and, and its ecosystem and how can you improve the, the, how can you get users involved in that? Let's start with Birgit again. My opinion is that we need success stories. And I think you're quite on the good way with your 
pilot studies and designing services, which really helps to show that this is feasible. And of course, we have to start at some stage, but then we have to expand. And by expansion, we know if, if the network is really working and if it's a su success story or if it's not working this way, we have to switch the, um, the parameters. And as a user, I am always interested in data accessibility. And I'm happy if I can access data easily, if I can submit data easily, if I can um, use some tools, some features, some standards. And to do it, I need some forces, which are also from outside. I need the funders to really show, push me to say, yes, you have to deposit your data, you have to do your data, give your data there or get data from there. Yes, thank you. Rafael, what's your opinion on that? How to engage? Um, in terms of dissemination, I think uh, activities such as this and the aforementioned ambassador program uh, are all uh, uh, good and worthwhile. Um, it may be beneficial to expand the efforts to explicitly address uh, uh, local channels, uh, which may exist in certain uh, uh, pieces or to identify or support uh, what could be called local champions. Uh, 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 so in, in, in order to implant seeds uh, uh, in a certain way, namely people that uh, may then become known as knowledgeable and uh, are more accessible for concrete questions if people run into problems, for instance, something like that uh, could prove to be beneficial. And just to illustrate that by an example, uh, in the Greater Munich area, we have since a few years an informal meetup that we call RD Munich or uh, Research Data München, uh, where every other uh, month we uh, uh, meet people from various institutions and uh, uh, usually with one or two quick uh, uh, short presentations on a specific topic, which may be EOS or NFDE related or something else of interest but then just update each other on uh, uh, recent experience, news and, uh, uh, and such. And those informal, and I mentioned that because these informal channels, channels can be very effective and reaching out to those, if that succeeds, can go a long way in my opinion. Thank you. So that's um, um, very clear. Um, Achim, what's your opinion to this? Yeah, so I would like to, to focus a bit on on universities, so, so how researchers in your universities could be reached. And um, there are, of course, the ways to do that via the, the international or national consortia, but I was thinking of a different um, route in that sense. So, um, <clears throat> so um, all the professors uh, in, in the universities are, belong to, um, to departments or in German, Fakultäten or Fachbereiche. And uh, I know that uh, there are sort of um, uh, at least in Germany, there are uh, people from the various universities coming together in, for example, the, the German Deutsche Fakultätentag. Yeah? And then also on the European level, um, there are some, some networks existing between, uh, between the countries here and, and, and the, the universities where there are specific uh, disciplines existing. So I know, for example, in computer science, there is the, the so-called Informatics Europe uh, network where um, a lot of um, uh, computer science informatics departments uh, at uni European universities uh, are grouped together and are networking. And, and that could be um, sort of like a, an additional route to, to, to bring USC uh, on the table and to, to sort of to publish the existence of the USC via this route into the universities and the, the professors uh, there. Okay, so this this um, I'll have another another question then uh, following this networking uh, a plea that you um, that you give. Um, now that we have already, of course, we need the examples and we need uh, the uh, the starters in this in this world coming from either the the ambassador program or from um, wider um, discussion groups um, that may of course, also be implemented in the, in the DEO context. Um, um, so for the, when we, when we move over to, to, the, to the NFDI context, and I'm keeping um, a close eye on the, on, the, on the questions and answers uh, section. So um, 
if if anyone has a question please uh, um, tell and uh, and i will be handing over to you but for the moment let let's move over to to the to the to the end of the eye to the networking to the incentive incentivization of 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 eos um and i'm since we're heavily involved here in services and also eos capillaries and services i would say um because EOSC has already put in place a lot of services, right? And, and has a, a policy framework and um, has worked through um, implementation projects so as like EOSC Pillar, but also the EOSC Future uh, project that, uh, that uh, Kai Graf has mentioned. Um, what experiences and processes that are now collected in EOSC can be beneficial for the development of NFDI, whether it is, is in the networking context or whether this is in the services context. In what respect can, can um, consortia ensure that, that these will be beneficial to both, so NFDI to EOSC and EOSC to NFDI? And I'm starting again with Birgit. Oh, sorry, I was in the chat at the moment trying to answer the question. Oh, I, okay. Sorry. We can we can wait, and then I'll give the hand to uh, to the give the voice to to Rafael. Yeah, well, when it comes to the interplay between NFDI and EOS specifically, um, my my observation from ongoing discussions over the recent years is that. Uh, there is oftentimes uh, uh, a lack of knowledge and understanding of uh, what's happening on the other side. And that then uh, results in a certain risk that um, uh, things are uh, approached in, in, in parallel and almost independently of each other, at least to a, a, a certain extent before people may then become aware of this. Uh, so uh, uh, it cannot be underestimated how important the flow of information is and also how important it is to keep that information updated on what is available, what is to be expected, what is at which level. Uh, uh, so that questions like, yeah, well, we need, and yes, we know there is something happening on the EOS side, but we need it now and it's not ready yet. So we do it ourselves. Something like that could potentially be uh, uh, avoided. Um, generally speaking, just be more careful in considering what really needs a local or national solution, where this, uh, what, it what is better dealt with at European or global level even. And as an example for the letter, essentially all things identification are better handled at a European, if not global level. And that is an understanding that I don't think everyone uh, uh, really has accepted or agrees to yet. So uh, uh, lobbying in that direction, for instance, uh, may also be something uh, uh, to consider. Thank you. Um, would you chime in here, Birgit? Yeah, thank you. Um, before we started with NFDI for biodiversity, we did a survey and we asked the people what are the reasons why you want to submit data, or why you want to reuse data, and some trusted repositories are sometimes also needed. So sometimes the um, close context to who you give your data is quite important, and that provides maybe the interim steps because EOSC is very big. Uh, so you need all the different levels in between to have a um, different, a certain um, yeah, deficiency or, or, or inter, uh, yeah, internet operability to see who you're giving the data to, because especially biodiversity data is sometimes a very um, difficult data to provide for just everybody. So I think um, you made quite good structures, uh, like look at governance, community involvement, technical concepts, and legal ethical aspects. And by being so clear who is working where and when at which stage really helps how to make it interoperable. And I think we are in a good way because of this base work, what I would probably encourage would be more communication, what you tried in this um, presentation here, which is really great. Mm -hmm. So we really know what we are doing, who is doing what, because I think we really can merge things together very nicely. Yeah, and, and um, I will, I'll let first Achim, if he has some on, uh, something on his sleeve on this. Uh... Yeah, so, so so many many good things were already already mentioned by the previous two speakers. Um, so or my, my my panelist colleagues. So I would like to add one more thing. So um, <clears throat> I've taken a look here at the 
so-called NFDI all mailing list. And actually this event here was, was announced uh, via that mailing list. And this is very good. But it, when, when I saw that email, I was thinking, okay, so, so how can we sort of more bring more, more the people together, the people in, in the country, in Germany, in NFDI, know what is going on in the USC. And I mean, the, the, the obvious thought that comes to my mind is that, that every information that is uh, coming, from, uh, from, coming in from USC, so example, from the USC Association, could simply be forwarded uh, to that NFDI all mailing list. But at the same time, you, you, you automatically end up in, in, in spamming thousands of people that are involved in NFDI. So we, we, we probably need to really think of a, a, uh, another way of how to, to bring that information together. I think the, on, from the other side, it works quite well because NFDI is a mandated organization in the USC Association. So everything that is happening in NFDI can, can go in through an organized channel into the USC Association. But how should we do that the other way around without sort of spamming thousands of people? Uh, and this is something where, uh, I don't know, I, I, I don't have a good idea right now. Um, but I see Chris Ebert has raised his hand, so maybe uh, he, he has a good idea. You always have a good idea. So. <laughs> I, can see, I can see raised hands, so apologies, okay. uh, Christoph, but uh, go ahead. And we'll Thanks, to uh, Nalia uh, later. Uh, I see this question also in the chat, so yeah, go yeah, ahead, yeah, uh, Christoph. Yeah, if you can, can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Uh, I, I would like to chime in to, to Achim's uh, thing. And I, I'm in my mind, you know, I'm, I'm trying to think it through from a user side. And uh, if a service is provided by EOSC, um, it's often important that the university where I am is using that thing, you know, if, if it's easy to pipe it through and I don't know where the, where the data really is, yeah? I'm, I'm, I'm making it very simple, but, but I don't know where my SQL table in my iPhone lies because I don't care, I want to call somebody. And, and, and that's, I, I know this is very complicated, but, but the question is, if you have a service on the EOS already provided, how can we pipe it through to the user without them needing to choose, oh, I'll go to my own university, I go to Achim and ask him if the KIT given can give me high performance computing, or I go to the EOS. If this is, if I have to choose that I have to learn about each service as a user, as a material scientist or a, as a biologist, how do I do that? Like Achim said, you have to spam everybody with everything. Just imagine that you get all the services from the NFTI to everybody. <laughs> how crazy would that be? So it's, it's rather making it, easy to access by helping universities and I'm, I'm damn sure that the universities are happy for every service which is provided and they don't need to pay for yeah but but how to get that i think this this needs to be in a smart way that's my my two cents about that yeah <laughs> sorry yeah, it's, it's an interesting observation, uh, Chris, because at the moment everybody at least in the ILSC uh, area is running to bring services on the platform, right? And then what effect does that have if these people are then over, overflown by, overrun by services that they cannot place or that they do not know how to uh, select, right? That's, uh, that's really something, the overload could be something. Mm -hmm. And um, I'd like to also to make an additional remark um, that uh, Birgit mentioned the trust activity. And this is something that um, EOSC has dealt a lot with uh, in the past, and that's why services are still very scarce. It turns out that it is very, it's not easy to have services on a platform that you can actually trust, that are reliable, that can be uh, used for a long term, and that, that you're not, um, and so you're trusting your data there. Um, and this is one of the reasons that, that there is a whole policy framework behind EOSC that somehow also has to be imported in this in in the air in the area of nfdi i i, I suspect but um uh, i see nalia in uh, redback in Göttingen has already a long time posted a question here and the question is and i'm asking this um and i'm asking marie first to answer this question uh, the question is what does eosc offer that nfdi doesn't already offer uh, for national researchers in the other words, what is the added value of EOSC? 
in a, in a national context where you already have um, um, an organization that takes care of data infrastructures. Your mic I cannot hear you. switched off. Um, yeah, well, um, you know, I'm in Austria based, so I don't really know much about your national, um, uh, but in general, I mean, I, I would say, Oh, maybe I hand over the question. So. Okay. No. So that's 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 a very um, it's very not very nice from from me, of course, to ask you this. But I was thinking, why do we need national infrastructures when we already have something European, right? Uh, what would be the additional value? But um, maybe I ask Nalia to if she can open her microphhone to. If, if I ah, if I may sure. provide uh, at, okay. least, uh, at least part of an answer to that question, um, okay. uh, in a sense, I was trying to allude to that with my previous remark, uh, uh, being careful what is better uh, uh, provided locally versus national versus European versus global. And um, uh, examples being, for instance, um, identification systems I mentioned, that's best provided uh, uh, on a global scale, but that is usually hard to achieve. But um, all the PID, AAI systems and such that are uh, addressed by the uh, EOSC core services, those should be used, not, not reinvented and uh, uh, locally deployed. I see, don't, I don't. Uh, um, I don't see much sense in, in, in doing so, except for maybe uh, 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 providing an additional server for more resilience of the service, but that would be then supporting the European service. Um, also, uh, when it comes to the identification of people, um, uh, we, we often consider this a, a, a done deal, but sometimes uh, uh, people run into the problems that arise when uh, uh, researchers move around, change affiliation or drop out of the system. Uh, what happens in, uh, in those uh, uh, situations? And that is also something that uh, uh, is better addressed at a, um, a broader scale uh, uh, rather than locally. And um, uh, all these things are considered at European level and don't need duplication on national level, I would say. So can, can I, yeah. can I jump right. in here? So I would actually like to almost um, turn the question around. Yeah? What does EUSC offer that NFDI doesn't already offer? I would turn it around because th th there was an, uh, an NFDI meeting this morning about common infrastructure. And, and I mean, the, the topic of AI was already briefly touched uh, by, by, by Raphael, but I would argue it the way around. There are already existing services in EUSC that could be easily used in NFDI, or at least it is not needed to reinvent the wheel in Germany, yeah? because there is a plethora of experience on the European level. Yeah? Uh, so just to give you um, uh, two examples. Yeah? So um, uh, this morning, it, it was about a multi-cloud environment. Yeah? Well, we already do that. We, we already do have that. Yeah? And I just, just give you one or few examples. And that's the, the EGI Fed Cloud yeah? that already exists since a few years. Yeah? Or the other example is um, to run a, a Dropbox-like service. Yeah? There is from the ULAT initiative a, a B2 Drop uh, service that already exists since, since, since a few years. That is actually um, um, connected to a European-wide AI solution. And that works beautifully. Yeah? So we, we don't have to sort of reinvent the wheel here in Germany because it has not been invented here in Germany. Yeah? So uh, that, is, that is something. So I, I would really like to turn around uh, that, that question here. Very good. Last, last remark. We're closing up. <laughs> Thank you. I'm, I disagree. <laughs> Sorry with that. <laughs> As a biologist, I come from the GBIF community and the GBIF is a node of nodes of nodes of nodes. So we have a centralized strategy uh, and we have a um, centralized secretary, which helps in making outreach, education and so on and the basic services. But it's really still helpful to have the nodes and within the nodes, you have the sub nodes and it's really, really helpful. So I, my experience is also with the gene banks where you have the three global gene banks as a researcher 
I use all three of them. Whenever one service is better, I use that one. Or when I have other demands, I'm happy to use the services of another one. So having the uh, variety and having the possibility to choose as a researcher is a great advantage. So I think, of course, we don't want to uh, we don't have to spend our very valuable resources on everything, but um, having a linkage and having some side effects is really a benefit for all of us. And I think even if we link and make it interoperable, I'm happy with that. Thank you. So as they say, competition will, of course, improve the, uh, the quality. That's probably the message, right? Yeah. Okay, um, it's already uh, one minute past the end time. Uh, so we're already in negative virtual time here. Um, I hope the audience um, that you are now a little bit more informed about EOSC and that it will, um, will engage you, um, will help you engage there. Um, and that open access and the open data access is something that uh, whether this is going to be through EOSC or through NFDI will that that is sure, sure that will bring you benefits for research. Um, apologies that time was limited and it turns out that this always is the case when the, you have these uh, sessions, but um, uh, that will be um, counteracted with a promise now that there will be an update of this webinar in the in the near future where we will plan a little bit of a longer time and have more time for discussions and and, and presentations in the in the near future and i hope we can do this again um, and i'm starting to think now also with the help of uh, of nfdi um, and the assistance of of, of nfdi and Therefore, I'm here now, um, yes, uh, finishing with uh, thank you all the speakers, um, the members of the panel um, still here, and, uh, and of course, as also the audience for um, interacting with us and, uh, um, and your contributions. I thank you all for participating and hope to see you soon in a, in a new installment of this, of this, um, present, of this webinar. And please subscribe to the newsletter if you want to hear as soon as possible when, you, when there is something new. Thank you all and um, have a great day. Bye-bye. Thank you, Jos. Thank you all. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.